What's up, everybody? Hey. Welcome back to Fellowship Greenville students. We're so glad that you are joining us for another Sunday night. We're excited to be here. We're excited to join you. Happy Easter, the most significant day of the year for our faith. We, are, we love that we're celebrating it with you. So welcome. Welcome. So we have some updates on March Crackness. We yes. have uploaded on our website, FG Students, a new bracket. So it's pretty much just an updated bracket if all of your eggs are out already. Yeah, so, so if if your if your eggs are cracked, busted, or whatever, this gives you another chance to participate yeah. in the tournament. A, a fresh start with a fresh bracket for the round threes leading into the final four and then the championship. So jump back in. We're having a great time with March Crackness. Yeah. Also, guys, I would just want to encourage you, keep connected with your small groups and with others during this time. I know, I know it can be lonely. I know it can maybe even seem like a break. And yeah, we'll hop back in when everything's back to normal. But let's not wait till then to maintain our community. So make sure you're remaining connected with your small groups, with your friends and things like that. Yeah. Yeah. Well, we're excited for another service. Buckle up. Get ready. <laughs> Love you guys. <laughs> hey, thanks for joining me once again for Dance Moves with Dally. We've got something that's very versatile for you compared to last week where that was kind of a grand finale move. This move today, it's called the bunny bop and you can really use it in any situation. Whether you're at a school dance or you're bopping around the house to some music or even if you're in some musical worship. So go ahead and stand up, get on your feet and uh, place your feet maybe about shoulder width apart. That's where I like to have them. And all you're gonna do is just bend the knees and bop. You can go just all to the left or all to the right, or you can go back and forth. It's the bunny bop, folks. You can do it how you want. Not only can you do it from side to side, but you can also feel free to add any kind of hand motions you want to, right? So you're bopping and you make your hands go way out. You can keep them close, kind of do them in circles. You can raise them in the air, right? I said this could be used in worship. And that's the bunny bop, my friends. Let's try it together. Hey, you look good out there. This really is a move that anyone can use and you can use it in any situation. Next time you see somebody doing the bunny bop, go up to them and say, hey, I know that move. Hey, thanks for joining us once again for Dance Moves with Dally. What's up, high school? My name's Nathan, and we've got Abby and Molly here from our FGS team to sing with us tonight. Happy Easter. Today's a day where we remember and we're thankful and we rejoice because this day, a really long time ago, Jesus rose from the dead. The tomb was empty. Sin had been officially defeated, and our penalty, our debt, was no more. The resurrection is what seals our faith. It's what makes everything even matter today. So would you guys rejoice and sing this song with us? One, two, three, four. Oh, 
Jesus, things that are dead are coming back to life. Lives are being restored. Sin is defeated. Death is conquered. All through your resurrection and your death in our place. Your perfect sacrifice for us has paid the price of our mistakes, our wrongs. You have given us a gift of life free of charge to us. May we live a life in faith of your sacrifice, your life, your resurrection. And may we walk in grace. We love you a lot, Jesus. In your name we pray. Amen. Baylor would like to FaceTime. Georgia Calliope. Wow. Georgia, welcome to FaceTime with Rachel. I feel so honored to be here. Yes, you should be. You are an honorary (laughs) guest. Oh. So, Georgia, I have some questions for you. Oh, no, okay. Just a few questions. Um, So, my first question for you today is would you rather only listen to polka music or Nickelback for the rest of your life? I don't know what either of those things are, but polka music sounds really cool. You don't know what Nickelback is? No. Oh, Georgia. Okay, well, we'll go with polka music, but um, go listen to some Nickelback. Okay. Is this it's, some old? It's one, of that- those, it's one of those bands that um, a lot of people... It makes their ears bleed. So gotcha. we'll go with polka music. So um, next question. Um, would you rather break everything you touch or get shocked everything every time you touch something? Maybe get shocked every time I touch something. Okay. That would be kind of sad if I broke everything. I know. No one would want you to come to their house. No, nope. that would be really sad. Well, that's a good answer. I'm glad. I hope that I hope that works out for you, Georgia. What? I can't go to anyone's house anyways, though. So, I mean... That's fair. That's very I'm, fair. I break my whole house, though. My that next works. question for you. Would you rather always smell bad around the person that you like or always say something embarrassing around them? Always say something embarrassing. Okay. Do you feel like you already do that? Yeah, exactly. Okay, so- okay. Just right. checking. So Just checking. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, next question. What is the most embarrassing moment of your life thus far? Oh. <laughs> Rachel, you know the most embarrassing moment of my is life. Is it a good one? It is a good one. Is it one that you can share with other people? I don't know. Okay. I'm, I think... Do you want a different question? Yeah, that would be okay. great. Okay, different question. Um, What's the most exciting thing you've ever done? Oh my gosh, these are hard questions. I don't yeah. know. Think back to just those exciting memories of your life. Um, when you come over and eat tacos with me. Oh, wow. That's the most exciting. That was tender. That was tender. Um, all right. What is your favorite part of the month of April? Easter. What do you love about Easter? Um, I love, I love Jesus. Aw. Wow. Such yeah. a good FG student. Man, love it. All right. Well, Georgia, last question I have for you. How have you been spending intentional time with Jesus during this time? I have been praying and reading my Bible and like watching the house church with my family. So that's been a good time. That's sweet. I love it. I love it. Well, Georgia, I love you. Love you, bud. Thank you for this time. Um, Do you know the song, I've Had the Time of My Life? Yeah, I do. Okay, so you're going to sing it with me. You ready? But we're instead of time, it's going to be FaceTime. I don't know if I know it that well, Rachel. All right. Well, it's just like that little part. Like, I've had the FaceTime in my life. Are you ready? Okay. All right. Ready? Three, 
You have to lead because you're the singer in this in this pair right now. Okay, ready? Three, two, one. I've had the face time of my life. And I owe it all to you. Owe it all to you, Rachel. Georgia. Thanks, Georgia. You're welcome. Have a great rest of your Monday. Thank you. Bye, Rachel. Hey guys, and welcome to another great week here at Fellowship Greenville Students. We are so glad you're joining us tonight in worship. It is Easter Sunday. It is the most significant day of our faith in the entire year. And we are so glad that you're worshiping with us uh, tonight or whenever you're watching this video. But it is a significant today. day. Today is the day that we celebrate Jesus coming back from the dead, uh, in which that event verifies and validifies everything that Jesus did and said and taught. Uh, Paul says in the book of Corinthians that if the resurrection didn't happen, then all of this is in vain. None of, none of the rest of it matters if this one event didn't happen. And so this is the hinge point of our faith where we celebrate that Jesus, who was dead, defeated death and came back to life and invites us into that same life. So thanks for joining us tonight and celebrating that with us. Uh, I want to focus uh, not entirely on the resurrection tonight, but actually on a different story, just days away from the resurrection. This is in the, the final moments and the final hours of Jesus's life. I want to look at a little bit of a different story as we gear our hearts and our minds towards Easter Sunday today. Uh, and it can be found in Luke 23. So if you have your Bibles right there in front of you or a Bible app or something like that, go ahead and just uh, dog ear bookmark Luke 23. Uh, a few years ago, wow, what is it? <clears throat> 2020. So 15 years ago, a few years ago now, uh, 15 years ago in 2005, I started uh, college, started my undergrad journey. I was an out-of-state student. I grew up in Tennessee. Uh, and I went to a private university. And so needless to say, it was expensive. And so my mom and I, you know, we did everything we could to kind of ease um, ease the payment and, and the price of tuition. Uh, so, you know, I applied for every scholarship you could and, uh, you know, picked up jobs here and there, part-time jobs and whatever else. And, you know, we saved up and but it was still expensive. And so at the end of at the end of undergrad, you know, I was coming out of that with some debt like most students do. And then something interesting happened. It was one of the one of the clearest moments in my life when I sensed God speaking to me saying, "I want you to go to seminary and get a master's degree." And I thought, "No way." Like further education was the furthest thing on my mind. I did not want to do more school. I didn't know how we would afford it, but nothing was bringing me peace in my heart and soul. None of the options on the table that were present to me, except when I really started to consider seminary and pray about that, I started to feel at peace and settled, even though it was not my design. And so I thought, all right, God, like I'll, I'll submit to you. I'll be obedient in this. And, and so I'm not the strongest student. It was incredibly hard for me but I, I went on to seminary and began another four-year degree. So needless to say, coming out of my time, uh, the season of education in my life, coming out of that, I had accrued some, some student debt, as, as most of us do. And by God's grace, it wasn't this astronomical number that I hear so many uh, coming out of school with, but it was still significant. And so my wife and I, Lauren, began a plan. How are we going to make payments on this? You know, how, how do we budget around this? Uh, could we double down on some payments and really get aggressive with this thing? And, and so on and so forth. And so we began the journey of paying off that debt. Well, my grandfather contacted me after I graduated seminary. My oldest son is named after him uh, to give you a clue into our relationship, just a very a significant man in my life. He contacted me after seminary and said, grandson, you're going to be paying back all of those debts and all of them are going to accumulate interest. So you're not just going to pay back what you borrowed. You're going to pay back on top of that. Would you allow me to pay off what you owe right now 
And that way they don't accumulate interest. And then you can just start paying me back what, what you lo owe on those loans. That way you'll just pay the number that you borrowed. You don't have to pay all this extra stuff and interest. And my wife and I were so blown away. We were so blessed by that. Um, and of course we accepted graciously because what a blessing to a young, broke, married couple that we were. Uh, the, first, the first house we lived in, oh my goodness, I have so many stories. So we accepted his offer graciously. And then my wife and I began a, a plan and a process of paying my grandfather and my grandmother back uh, every month, these incremental payments. Well, fast forward a few years, we had our first son, Trent. And when we had Trent, uh, a little bit of time went by and my wife and I received a letter in the mail. And it was from my grandparents. I opened the letter and inside was this uh, handwritten chart that had been photocopied that basically showed every month over the past few years, the payments that my wife and I had made to my grandparents, the amount that we had made, so on and so forth. And compared to the total amount that we still owed, I mean, we had barely made a dent in this thing, but it, it, it was just showing, hey, this is everything you've done. You've been faithful in your payments. And then still inside the envelope was a letter, a handwritten letter. And so I took that out and I unfolded it. And my grandmother and my grandfather had written my wife and I a letter saying, you guys have made payments on the debt you owe, but we've discussed this and we've decided we want to clear your debt entirely. You don't owe us anything anymore. And you know, it was one of those letters like you, you read it and you're like, surely I'm not understanding this correctly. This is too great a gift. This is a gift of this magnitude. It, it's hard to even wrap your mind around. And so I reread it and reread it. And then I, I came in and showed my wife and, and, and actually had some tears welling up in my eyes because of the generosity and the love of my grandparents. And sure enough, she read it and it was saying the same thing. You guys have been faithful in your payments and your grandfather and I have decided we want to erase your debt. And I'm sure the fact that Lauren and I starting to have kids was a factor in this. They, they wanted our money to go towards the grandchildren rather than back to them. But the fact is, Lauren and I had done nothing to deserve this or earn this. We hadn't asked for this. This wasn't part of the original plan. My grandparents, because of their love and their generosity, decided to bless my wife and I by erasing the amount of money that we owed to them. Now, what's amazing about that is it freed us up uh, It and, and we were completely free. Like we weren't obligated to pay anything, but they still had the hole in their budget from where they paid off all those lenders a few years prior. It's, it's not just like, hey, the debt's somehow been paid. We're square. We consider you square. Everything's good. No, like they were freeing us of paying them back by taking on this gigantic hole in what we still owe. And they were releasing us guilt-free and shame-free. They wanted to bless us because of their love and their generosity. This is their decision based on what they wanted to do because of their love, not because of anything we've done or earned. And this is one of those gifts. I mean, you think about and you look at and, and you're just blown away. And even to this day, like I just have a hard time responding to this because there's there's such a drive in me of like, no, like I, I, we have to pay this back. We can't accept something like this. Like you paying off the loans and and allowing us not to pay interest. Okay, that's one thing, but we're still gonna pay you back. But this, like just erasing the, the debt entirely, we can't do this. I mean, it just leaves you speechless. Their love and their generosity prompted them to release us, to free us. They, they literally traded places with us in terms of our debt and our payment. They didn't owe, they took on our debt. We did owe and we took on their freedom, like we, we don't owe anything now. There's a story of Jesus in the scriptures in his final days, in his final hours before his crucifixion on the cross, where Jesus has finally been arrested. The, the entire um, journey of Jesus, his ministry has, has gained him uh, some public enemies, the religious the righteous elite of the day who desired power and control didn't like Jesus because he ruffled their feathers, he stirred the pot, 
Jesus was way more about grace and love and relationship, and they were way more uh, about control and power and religion, and, and so they didn't like Jesus, and so they were patiently waiting. They were biding their time until the perfect moment when they could make accusations against Jesus or accuse Jesus and get him arrested. And so sure enough, they've made all these false accusations. Jesus is arrested and he's brought before the, the governor of this area. His name is Pilate. And the, and the, these, these um, religious uh, Jewish men bring Jesus to Pilate and they make all these accusations and, and they, they basically say he, he has stirred up the people. He won't let us contribute things to Caesar, who was the, the king of Rome, right? He won't let us contribute to Caesar. He's stirred up the people. He's taught all through the region. He's, he's creating chaos, in other words. And so Pilate has this interrogation with Jesus. He takes him into a room and begins to talk with Jesus. And as he talks with Jesus, he is just convinced that the man he's looking at is innocent of everything that these people are saying, which was true. They were lies. And so he comes back to the people who are just geared up and fired up with this, this murderous intent. And he says, listen, I don't find anything wrong with Jesus. Like, I find him innocent. And they say, no, he's not. He's been traveling everywhere. And, and Pilate realizes, oh, he's not even from this area. He's from Galilee. Well, this isn't even my jurisdiction. You got to take him over to Herod. He rules over Galilee. And so then they transport Jesus over to Herod. And Herod interrogates him and comes to the same conclusion. This man's innocent. There's nothing wrong with him. So he sends him back to Pilate. Pilate talks to Jesus again and comes to the same exact conclusion. <laughs> this guy's innocent. I, why have you brought him before me? All these accusations you're talking about. I don't find anything wrong with this man. He's done nothing deserving of death. And so Jesus has gone on this back and forth and no one can find fault with Jesus. But the religious elite of the day with murderous desires in their hearts, desiring power, and desiring to eliminate Jesus who disrupts their hold on society, they're not ready to be done with this. You see, in that day, Rome ruled over the Jews. Even though Jerusalem and Israel was still populated by Jews, it was Rome who governed it and ruled it. But in order to keep the peace, Rome had this uh, ritual, this, this um, ceremony that every year during Passover, which was a Jewish holiday, a, a, a week-long festival, Every year during Passover, Rome would release uh, one prisoner for the Jews as, as almost a peace offering. Like, hey, we have one of yours in our custody, but it's Passover. It's your sacred festival. And because we're trying to maintain peace, even though we're ruling over you as a, as a sign of mercy, we'll release a prisoner. And so Pilate, the governor of this area, brings this up to the people. And he says, look, I find no fault with Jesus. Now, you know that we release a prisoner every year on Passover. Who would you like me to release? And he's assuming that they're about to say Jesus because he, nor Herod, and then back to Pilate, they can't find a thing wrong with him. They're baffled by the fact that they've even brought Jesus before. And they say, who would you like us to release? Pilate assumes they're about to say, all right, well, I mean, I guess you got us. We really don't have anything on this guy. We just don't like him. So I guess you can release Jesus. And that's not what they say. Look at verse 18, Luke 23, 18. The crowds all cried together, away with this man and release to us Barabbas. And Luke puts a little note in here of who Barabbas was, a man who had been thrown into prison for an insurrection started in the city and for murder. So Barabbas is this guy who has tried to overthrow Rome. Barabbas is this guy who has created an insurrection, who has created uh, this rebellion, and he's actually tried to overthrow Rome. He's tried to disrupt the government of the day. He's tried to go against Caesar, the king of Rome, and he's convicted of murder. He's actually taken life, and now he's in prison. The religious elite 
are accusing Jesus of similar things, saying, no, he has stirred up the people. He's created chaos among the people. He's going against Caesar, the king of Rome. None of those were true. I mean, look at the hypocrisy of the religious leaders right here. Which prisoner do you want me to release? This man who I find no guilt in? Or this man who is guilty of everything you're accusing him of? And they say, yeah, him, Barabbas, release Barabbas. What? Like, Pilate is dumbfounded by this response. He's, he's baffled. Look at verse 20. Pilate looks at them once more. He addresses them, desiring to release Jesus. A Roman governor, powerful man, is actually desiring, no, 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 I want to release him, like Jesus. I don't, this man is guilty of murder, of leading an insurrection. This man is, is a, a terrorist against the Roman Empire. I don't want to release him. You guys hear me, right? He's innocent. Who do you want me to release? Barabbas. And he looks at him again, desiring to release Jesus. But they kept shouting, crucify him, crucify him. A third time, Pilate pleads with them. Why? What evil has he done? I found in him no guilt deserving of death. I'll, how about this? I'll punish him. I'll punish him for you, but then I'm going to release him. But they were urgent, demanding with loud cries that he should be crucified, and their voices prevailed. So Pilate decided, verse 24, that their demand should be granted. He released the man, Barabbas, who had been thrown into prison for insurrection and for murder and for whom they asked, but he delivered Jesus over to their will. So Pilate's experiencing the pressure of the riot here, the chaos. The people want Jesus to be killed and Barabbas to be freed. So imagine the stage, right? Imagine the scenario. The stage is set with these characters. And on one hand, you have Jesus, who is innocent, guilt-free. He's done nothing wrong. A Roman governor, a second Roman ruler, and coming back to the original Pilate, they, can, they can't find a thing wrong with him. Six times in Luke 23, Luke makes a note of his innocence six times. Even the criminal on the cross later when Jesus is crucified says, this man's done nothing wrong. Like his innocence is clear to everyone. But the religious rulers who do not like Jesus because of his message, his love, his grace, is disrupting their control. They want him gone. So to Pilate's other side, we have this man named Barabbas who is guilty. He is a murderer. He is a terrorist against Rome. And the people cry for his release. So the stage is set. Now, Barabbas' name, by literal translation, Bar means son, and Abba means father. So Barabbas' name literally translates to son of the father. And on the other side of Pilate is Jesus, who we know as son of the father. One is innocent and one is guilty. One has done nothing and one is deserving of the punishment fitting his crime. You have the son of the father and son of the father standing here before the people and there's this middleman asking them, which one do you want, the innocent one or the guilty one? And they say, release the guilty one. Pilate says, no, 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 you don't understand. He's done nothing. They say, kill him crucify him. So Pilate gives over to their wishes and he releases Barabbas. And Barabbas is thinking, yeah, my people, I run these streets. I got these streets, my people. And he goes off, the guilty man. Jesus then begins the journey towards the death that was meant for Barabbas. This picture on this stage is a foreshadowing, it's a taste of the grace that God is about to display on the cross and through the empty tomb. You see, this is a, a stage set, this, this glimpse in history, which is actually a, a, a deeper insight into the cosmic realm of what's going on. God in the flesh, innocent and pure and guilt-free, is, 
is doing this holy swap with this man who is guilty and it is due uh, the punishment fitting his crime. And, and, and yet Jesus takes what was due him and gives to him what was merited to Jesus. His freedom is given to Barabbas and his guilt is given to Jesus. His punishment is given to Jesus. This instant, this moment in time is a, a snapshot of what's happening in the cosmos of the world where God is taking on the punishment of humanity, where God is taking on the, 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 the guilt of humanity. Every, everything they've ever committed, everything uh, that has ever been done or, or thought or acted out by humanity in which we are guilty and deserving of that punishment because we've sinned against God, God in the flesh, the innocent one, the son of the father is taking those things, allowing those things to be transferred onto himself and his righteousness and perfection, his innocence is being now given to the guilty. It's a cosmic swap in which the innocent is condemned and the guilty is freed. See, I think Luke is telling this story because we're supposed to interject ourselves within, within both characters. As we look at Barabbas, son of the father, we identify with his guilt. We know that we're guilty before a holy God. We know we've done wrong things. We know we've sinned. And yet his sin, his punishment is given to the innocent, just as ours was given to Jesus on the cross just a few hours after this story. And it is by Jesus taking our guilt and, and, and what we deserved that we're actually spiritually freed. You know, we're not standing on a stage with a Roman governor and people shouting, but we are standing on a cosmic stage of morality and our sin and our shame and our guilt and all of those things have been willfully taken by Jesus so that we can be spiritually freed in this world and life. And yet Luke, I think, is also trying to help us understand we also identify with Jesus, our Savior, because as he died on the cross, we die on the cross. As he rose from the dead days later, we raise from the dead. Paul says that we share in Christ in his death and resurrection. The old us is gone, new things to come, that we have actually uh, empathized and somehow connected through the death of Jesus, our old selves have died, and through the resurrection of Jesus, our new selves are now alive. How is that possible? Because the innocent took, took guilt and punishment, and the guilty took freedom and innocence. The cosmic swap that has happened through the death and resurrection of Jesus, a snapshot of that is found here in the story of Barabbas and Jesus. As we celebrate Easter Sunday today, may we be reminded forever that the image of the cross is an image of victory and power. It's an image of, of love and hope. And we should respond with gratitude and thankfulness for what Jesus did for us. And then as we look to the empty tomb, may we forever ever be in awe and reminded of the fact that we have life because he lives. That we are no longer dead in our sins because he took those, nailed them to a cross, and then left the tomb empty. May we forever celebrate the sacrifice and the resurrection of Jesus Christ, who died in our place and gives us life by the empty tomb. And if you've never believed in Jesus or began a relationship with him or you want to start one right now, I would invite you to simply talk to Jesus and ask him to forgive you and thank him for trading places with you and claim a belief in him that can begin right here and right now. And if you have any questions about what that looks like, you can contact us, uh, the FGS staff or team, we would love to follow up with you on that. Guys, we wish you the best, the best of Easter's. May we forever ever celebrate our risen Lord who left that tomb empty and is alive again. We love you guys. May God bless you all. Happy Easter.
Thanks, Matt, for that awesome message celebrating Easter and remembering the good news of Jesus dying for our sins and being raised to life. Last week, we challenged you guys to connect with people and to read over the 10 practices that Matt introduced to us last week. This week, we wanna challenge you guys to apply those 10 practices to Easter. This is a central holiday for us as Christians, remembering the love that Jesus displayed for us on the cross and the hope that he's given in his resurrection. So how can you apply our FGS 10 practices remembering this good news? So remember the 10 practices are building relationships, praying daily, reading scripture, resting, practicing solitude, being in creation, being responsible, worshiping, practicing restraint, and giving God thanks daily. Maybe this looks like reaching out to three people this week and asking them what the Easter story means to them and telling them what it means to you. Or reading Luke 23 daily, the Easter story, and thanking Jesus for dying for our sins and raising to life. Or maybe spending time alone listening to what the Holy Spirit wants to say to you this week. So this week, we wanna challenge you to go back on our Instagram and look at those two posts that have the 10 challenges the 10 practices on there. And you can also find those in the parent email that was sent out last week. So you can read over those, maybe write down how you personally can connect and apply these 10 practices to the Easter story this week. As you're all connecting with your small groups over Zoom, Marco Polo, FaceTime, email, whatever, here are some discussion questions for you and your group to talk about. So the first one is, have you ever been in debt to someone like Matt was in his story or have someone else owe you something? And how did that feel? So it might be something like money. It could be maybe you bought them a meal and they don't have Venmo. And so how are they gonna pay you back? So how did that make you feel? The second one is to read Luke 23 together and then discuss how do you relate to Barabbas in this story? How has our punishment been taking, taken away by Jesus's death? The third question is to read 2 Corinthians 5.17 and then ask, how have you become a new creation in Christ? And how does this relate to Jesus in Luke 23? And then the fourth thing that we want you guys to talk about is how can you respond to Jesus's death and resurrection with gratitude this week, which is one of our 10 practices. So we hope that helps you guys. We hope that you connect with your small groups this week. Don't forget to do that. It's a great way to reach out to people and talk to them. And we wanna challenge you with this. Hey guys, we're bringing back a fan favorite segment, Boomer or Nah. Charlie may or may not smack himself in the face this time. Boomer or Nah, nah. Boomer, Boomer or nah. nah, better get ready because it's Boomer or nah. nah. Okay, where are we dropping? I think this proves you're a Boomer. <laughs> oh, I have no idea. <laughs> okay, next question. Okay, boys, where are we dropping? No clue. Okay. Okay, Rob Marks. Finish these song lyrics. Okay. Picture perfect. You don't need no satisfaction. Mm. I don't. Oh, that's I don't get no satisfaction. Sorry. Okay. Uh, when someone spills the tea, what are they doing? Tinkling. <laughs> okay. When something is lit. That what? means it is hype. It is lit. It is fun. Yeah. Good it job, is, man. It is a party. Yes. Good job. Dude, I know how the kids... Th Dude, here's a funny one. My mom thought LOL was lots of love. One day she texted my brother and I, pray for your dad today. He has two funerals, LOL. <laughs> <laughs> lots of love. Lots of laugh out loud. All right. Thanks, man. Third question. <laughs> Can you demonstrate how to hit the woe? How to hit the woe? Hmm. I... I no, I can't demonstrate that. I have okay. no idea what that is. No problem. Can you demonstrate how to hit the woe? Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, something like that. No, I got no clue. <laughs> Dude. <laughs> Dude, I live in a hole. Okay. I, uh... Okay, where are we dropping? Um, uh, at the mall. Boomer or not. Boomer or not, better get ready because it's Boomer or not. Hey guys, thanks so much for joining us tonight. We love you. We hope you have a great week. Make sure to connect with us this week on Instagram Live, live at lunch, and with your small groups on Zoom or Marco Polo or FaceTime. And join us right now 
on Instagram Live. Happy Easter. Bye, guys. Bye. Bye. Happy Easter. Mm.